Now, the charity uh, Oxfam, which uh, pretty much everybody would be uh, very familiar with, has circulated a survey to its 1,800 staff um, in Britain, which is describing whiteness as, quote, the overarching preservation of power and domination for the benefit uh, of white people. And uh, a survey on racial justice, which it distributed to its staff, says that white privilege uh, is a byproduct of a racist system and that racism is, quote, a power construct created by white nations for the benefit of white people. Yeah, the document goes on to say that anti-black racism is the most harmful and insidious of racism, and that the charity does not recognize reverse uh, racism, that's racism directed against white people. Yes, now GB News presenter uh, Inaya Falarin Iman is here uh, joining us this morning. Um, uh, my views on this are quite strong um, in, in terms of how ridiculous I think it is that they're uh, you know, sending their staff this really divisive and actually quite offensive um, material. What do you make of this? I mean, I think there's a few things going on here. I mean, the first thing, at least in my view, is how a lot of corporations, and I would say Oxfam is effectively a corporation, it has thousands of staff, essentially use a lot of these fashionable ideas around gender, race, um, and other things in order to provide moral cover for criticism around other actions that it has been engaging with. So we do know that um, only a few years ago Oxfam was subject to an investigation over many of its staff involved in um, sexual misconduct in, in Haiti and Chad and that caused a lot of controversy and actually a lot of people lost huge faith in the organisation as a result of that. So now hearing them talk about um, what are essentially, which is the second point, quite opaque ideas of critical race theory, whiteness, structural racism, all of these types of things. It's, it's a way of, it, at least in my view, avoiding real scrutiny and criticism because mm. many, many people do not even know how to engage in these concepts because they're highly complex academic concepts um, that are very difficult to deconstruct and challenge. But what I would say is that I think one of the things about a lot of the conversations we've had about race and racism is that I do think that um, we haven't, as a society, been able to really talk about um, w what the notion of whiteness and blackness actually means. So when we think about those concepts, they do have their roots in slavery, and, and, and those racial concepts were used to, to, to justify the exploitation of certain people historically. And it's entirely legitimate to examine how those things still play out today. Mm. But I think that many of these frameworks and lenses, I think, do much more to obscure than yeah. to illuminate. But, but for me, I think, uh, you know, my concern is how I interact with uh, the average person that I will encounter on the street, in my community, etc. And, you know, let's not forget that 85%, roughly 86% of the country is white people. So, you know, I, as an immigrant, as a black woman, you know, I, I am going to encounter more often than not a lot of white people and the last thing I want when I'm doing that is for them to firstly think that I am somehow looking at them like the enemy I'm walking around and every white person I meet I think they're evil and they're, and they're and to racist. to your credit you haven't made me feel like that. <laughs> well I'm, re I'm really pleased that, that that's the case but that's the last thing um, mm. I want and I really do fear my problem with a lot of this you know aside from all the kinds of um more ideological and conceptual problems with it is the fact that it's made me almost feel that white people are now looking at me and thinking, oh, well, oh, she's black, I have to tread on eggshells, what can I say, what can't I say, does she think I'm racist, can I interact with her and talk to her, you know, openly and honestly, and I fear that a lot of people will be thinking, no, I probably can't have a, a normal conversation with well, a black person anymore. But to me, these are part of the conceptual problems of this theory, because in a lot of ways it seems to reproduce the kinds of problems that it's seeking mm -hmm. to challenge, which is making assumptions, fundamental assumptions about people, purely on the basis of the colour of their skin. So if you're white, then you must be inherently privileged and part of this kind of oppressor class, regardless of what you do. And if you're black, you have no agency. You're a victim of this kind of structure that is impenetrable and you can't do anything about that. So that's part of the critique, I think, of critical race theory, many of these theories, that actually they don't seem to challenge um, racism, but they actually produce a new form of racial thinking where we can just make assumptions about people based on the colour of their skin. And I think that, that, that that's not OK. Okay. And one of the things that strikes me, you know, I've always thought class is more 
uh, defining in the United Kingdom, maybe races in the States, but class is the defining thing here. And in the past, it was, it happened to be true that if you were from a black or ethnic minority, you were more likely to be lower down that class system. And therefore, there was a uh, the symmetry between being you know, of an ethnic minority and being poor, which mm. meant you were oppressed. But now, if you are a poor white person looking at a privileged black or Asian person, there's clearly there's been a decoupling of, 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 of the the sort of the class and yeah. the race issue. Yeah, I think it's... And that's, that's more dangerous. I think you're it? right, and I think it's so audacious of, you know, I see so many middle-class um, black people or ethnic minority people just almost talking down to white people, include, and they put um, under that poor white people because they say, well, all white, it's all white people. And I'm just thinking, you know, gr growing up in some of the communities I grew up in, and the, I'm seeing the most poor white people you can possibly think of, much poorer than many of the black people I've seen who have intergenerational, you know, their family ha haven't worked for generations, living in council house, very deprived people. And I just think how audacious and offensive and, and brazen for, you, you know, middle-class, well-educated ethnic minorities to tell poor white people that they somehow are more privileged than just because they're white. I mean, how the hell is this helping anything at all? Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, if we look at the origins of critical race theory, it comes from American legal studies. It tried to make sense of why um, the fact that there was um, legal equality, why we were still producing unequal racialized outcomes. That was a very specific concept to which critical race theory emerged. And why this is being imported to make sense of the completely different complexities that are going on in the UK. You mentioned, obviously, class is quite an important um, social determiner of, of, of people's outcomes here in ways in which is slightly different in America. And, and obviously, the, the civil rights movement in America, we had a very different history of trying to um, uh, uh, deconstruct racism in the United Kingdom. And I think that we should be trying to figure out what's going on here mm -hmm. rather than importing um, complex academic yeah. um, concepts from America in order to understand that the it's system still here. sort of lazy terminology that's applied particularly by the left. They mm -hmm. tend to attack the Conservative government, for instance, plenty of reasons to attack them. But to say that they are regressive and racist, when you look at the chance of the exchequer, you know, um, who is of a Hindu origin and a, an Indian origin, and you look at one of the other most powerful officers of state now, the new health secretary, mm. son of a Pakistani bus driver, you look at the home secretary, her parents were immigrants here from The business Africa, secretary, who's quasi court hang, It's you know. quite hard to say that there are a bunch of sort of nasty racists, even if the, mm. the, the, the prime minister himself is a sort of almost albino-esque old Italian. <laughs> um, exactly. I, I mean, this is what has been so frustrating over the last year, the way that the definition of racism has expanded so much that it's not even clear what it means or how we use it or how we make sense of racist things that happen anymore because, unfortunately, the rhetoric has been labelling so many things racist that we can't actually differentiate. And I agree with you, actually. Mm -hmm. We've got to be able to differentiate between, you know, what happened um, historically and what's going on now, structures of racism versus interpersonal racism. Those are completely different mm -hmm. things. What we have is this very homogenous definition and yeah. um, which is not bringing much clarity uh, and and uh, last question um quickly because this is a, a topic we'll be touching on later um which is somebody a guy i think it's a british guy um, he might be american has said he's transitioned he's racially transitioning from white to korean mm. so he's had all this surgery to make him korean um <laughs> which uh, i'm trying not to, to laugh while i'm saying the story but um you know, isn't that the natural conclusion of all this ridiculousness? Is that basically, if, racist, if racism is this vague thing and all these weird abstract concepts are being applied, well, why not? Why not transition race? Why not transition from white to black or black to white? I mean, I think that I think that you make a good point that it does seem like so much of the conversation right now just seems completely disconnected from material reality. Yeah. That it's all within abstract concepts where people can construct and reconstruct their identity. And we can't challenge because everyone can be essentially anything. And that's not helpful. We need to go back to first principles. What are the definitions of what these things mean? If you're Korean, that means a very specific thing. And not make it completely based off of what people choose to be on a given day. And then I, if you were to say in half a sentence, is this going to damage Oxfam or 
blow over? I think it will damage Oxfam because critical race theory is political. It is a very politicised and, as you rightly point out, divisive for many people. And I think this distracts away from actually dealing with genuine global poverty, which affects people across ethnic, cultural, religious or racial divides. Always great to have you on.